In 2016, while in Havana, Cuba, American diplomats were attacked by some kind of secret microwave weapon that caused permanent brain and nerve damage. I was standing at the kitchen window. I was washing dishes. All of a sudden, I felt like I was being struck with something. And today, the medical conditions caused by this microwave attack are now known as Havana Syndrome. Starting in 2016, U.S. diplomats and spies who were serving in Cuba started experiencing these strange sounds and physical sensations, mostly in their homes in the Cuban capital, then started coming down with these bizarre, unexplained symptoms. So here's the first report that came out from the doctors at the University of Pennsylvania. These individuals appear to have sustained injury to widespread brain networks without an associated history of head trauma. What we can't understand is why these people's brains look like that when they have no history of anything hitting them in the head. Havana syndrome is a condition that is currently affecting hundreds of people from around the world. And this presents a true mystery to us because we currently have no idea who it could be committing these microwave attacks, how they're committing these microwave attacks, or where their microwave weapon even is. How is it possible that hundreds of people from around the world are all suffering from the conditions of a microwave weapon, yet nobody has any idea who it is that built this, where they're doing this from, or why. They uniformly had dramatic damage to the otolithic organs, which are the gravity organs. So not just a little bit abnormal, all of them were abnormal. They found that the Havana syndrome brains had less white matter and less connectivity in them. And that led to what doctors started to refer to as a brain network disorder. And you'd think that the Pentagon and the American intelligence services would have a really good theory about the assailant by now. We looked at four possible mechanisms, but came up with one that we thought was most plausible and that was pulsed microwave energy. The National Academy of Sciences report was really helpful in saying, yes, it's our belief that these are directed energy attacks, um, that they are real, and that they were perpetrated by somebody, a state that has this kind of technology. But maybe the most unbelievable part of all of this is that the American intelligence services don't have a working suspect yet. In fact, they're insisting that the evidence that they do have says that it cannot be a foreign government doing this. Even as recently as 2024, this year, they've released a statement reinforcing that this is not a foreign government doing this. That's crazy. Making a statement like that creates a lot of implications. In recognition of your resilience and in appreciation of your dedication and continuing contributions to the service, despite injuries incurred in the line of duty in Havana, Cuba, I've read this so many times because it's on the award that hangs on my wall. And remember, hundreds of people from around the world have reported being attacked by microwave weapons, including people inside the continental United States and Canada. As many as 200 Americans working abroad have now who traveled to India this month is the latest flight to Vietnam. This year, two dozen new cases in Vietnam, another in Berlin. U.S. officials say potential victims on every continent but Antarctica. One of the first cases of a microwave weapon reported ever happened in Russia when American agents were bombarded in their hotel room. Even a CIA agent had his life destroyed by a microwave attack. Mark Polymeropoulos, a former U.S. intelligence officer at the CIA, was hit in 2017 by an invisible attack in a Moscow hotel. I've been in places like, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan. I've been shot at, but this was by far the most terrifying experience. An attack which brain experts now say was likely the result of a microwave weapon hitting American personnel in Cuba, China, Russia, and other places around the globe. The U.S. government has not identified the perpetrator, but current and former U.S. officials believe Russia is to blame. For a dedicated CIA officer, it hasn't been easy to accept that an invisible strike took him out of the game. Paul Maropoulos created a Superman mask in art therapy, thrusting a dagger through Superman's skull to represent the headaches which have changed him. The CIA agency seal? cracked. In October of 2014, NSA finally gives me a document. The National Security Agency confirms that there is intelligence information from 2012, four years before Havana, associating the hostile country to which Mr. Beck traveled in the late 1990s with a high-powered microwave system weapon that may have the ability to weaken, intimidate, or and without leaving evidence. This weapon is designed to bathe a target's living quarters in microwaves 
causing numerous physical effects, including a damaged nervous system. And with that high profile case that happened in Havana, Cuba, one might assume that because Cuba is an ally with Russia and the first attack happened in Russia, that this is probably Russia doing this. If you would have told me in August 2017 that five years later, we would still be covering this with no answers about who did this, why they did this, or how they did this, I wouldn't have believed you. I would have said the best intelligence agencies in the world are gonna figure out if someone is attacking our diplomats or not. Russia would fear the United States and Cuba having a good relationship with each other. Obviously, Putin would worry that Obama is stepping in to undermine Russia's power over Cuba. It seems that the purpose of those microwave attacks was to chase the Americans out of Cuba. And if that was the goal, then the microwave attack worked because the Americans emptied their embassy and sent all of their agents home. The fallout from this has been profound diplomatically for Cuba, for the United States, because it basically shut down diplomatic relations between the two countries. It was heartbreaking to leave. It was heartbreaking to have the relationship with Cuba that we were building collapse. It almost felt like we were giving up in a way, letting the bad guys win, the people who, who did this, if someone did this deliberately. And because Russia is the nation that would probably benefit most from Cuba kicking the United States out of their nation, you'd assume that Russia was the one that did it. Russia would be the clear culprit here. Who else could be the assailant, right? This is a video about directed energy weapons. There are many different kinds of lasers. Laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The Air Force has considered lasers for fighters, the Army as part of short range air defense, the Navy as a way to take on drones and small boats among other defense department needs. Now lasers can take out rockets and drones. By focusing kilowatts of power on a precise point, lasers can overheat, redirect, destroy, and damage targets causing them to be ineffective. They say, you know, we're in a good place right now for directed energy. It's out there on ships. The Army's testing it. Air Force is testing it with, with Thor. Fiber lasers, which are kind of the state of the art for air defense lasers right now, which is essentially the same kind of laser you might use for a welding uh, system or a cutting system that's used industrially. Laser weapons are nothing new. I'm sure you remember that giant chemical laser they slapped on the front of an old 747 back in the 90s. The US Air Force tested the airborne laser in the 90s and early 2000s, which was a modified 747 to shoot down missiles as they launched. The program cost around $5 billion over 16 years before it was canceled. That thing didn't really work out. And neither did that weird Star Wars concept that they had back in the 60s, where they wanted to launch a bunch of lasers into orbit to stop intercontinental missiles. As for how to power the thing, the concept was to use a nuclear pumped laser, where you would wrap a number of X-ray lasers around a nuclear device, detonate it. In the very, very short moments before those lasers were vaporized, they would focus the generated X-ray energy into an X-ray laser beam, and that, if properly aimed, would destroy the Soviet missiles. That's a pipe dream. But the thing is, they are using functional laser weapons and directed energy weapons on the battlefield already. And the Army is using lasers for its short-range air defense mission. The DEM SHORAD, or Direct Energy Maneuver Short-Range Air Defense Vehicle, can use a laser system to take out drones, and these weapons performed a live fire exercise earlier this year at the Yuma testing grounds. Which is to say that laser weapons aren't around the corner they're already here. Like, that's happening today. They've implemented a ton of laser defense mechanisms across the Navy as well, the most famous of which is probably Odin. The Navy has started fielding a system called Helios, which stands for High Energy Laser with Integrated Optical Dazzler and Surveillance, and it costs around $100 million for the initial production and testing and integration of the first devices. The current generation of U.S. Navy destroyers will carry Helios. And the next generation of American naval vessels that are already in production are going to be able to handle lasers three times as powerful as that. The Flight 3 uh, destroyers that are being built now um, have more spare power capacity and so the idea would be they're going to be supporting up, up 150 to 300 kilowatt laser. Within the next 10 years, who knows what the limit to their power outputs will be. Their only limit to the power of their lasers is the amount of power they can supply to them. As long as you can supply that laser with continuous power and you can continue continuously cool the device off as quickly as possible, 
well, then you've got essentially what they call an unlimited clip. Lasers are fun. We can see lasers. We're familiar with lasers. But microwaves are a completely different category of directed energy weapon. They're a similar concept to lasers, but work on a completely different principle. Leonidas is our flagship ground-based high-power microwave system. First mission application of that technology is going to be counter-drone. And what's great about our system is that it can take out both individual drone targets, or we can then widen our HPM beam to take out swarms of drones. The main difference is that a microwave destroys its target using electromagnetic radiation. They use dangerous and disruptive radio frequency rays instead of light heat energy to destroy their target. You're using microwaves to transmit energy, not coherent light. You're often gonna be hitting a wider physical area as opposed to a narrow point target, as a laser does, meaning that potentially while a a laser might operate like a laser pointer, a high-powered microwave weapon can be more like waving a torch into the sky. The method a HPM uses to deliver damage to a target is also fundamentally different. A laser is going to impart thermal energy to a target. It's going to burn it. But the target for most high-powered microwaves, when they aren't being used on squishy targets like personnel, is actually usually going to be a target's electronics. A microwave is going to potentially dump a lot of energy into a target's electronic components. That, in turn, can degrade or destroy them. And a lot of the counter-drone systems you see use a high-power microwave, so you know, drone zappers, etc., to disrupt um, or damage the electronics on a, on a, uh, a drone. Um, so high power microwave can be very effective um, and it requires less time on target. So you can do that in milliseconds. You can disrupt the electronics and force a, a drone, for example, to reboot and it causes it to lose its mission and has to turn off or something. If you target a building full of sensitive computer systems with a HPM on the right settings, then that building might show zero signs of damage from the attack, but the computers inside might be so badly screwed that it makes the old Xbox red ring of death look like a minor error. In 2012, Boeing announced the successful test of the counter electronic High-Powered Microwave Advanced Missile Project, or CHAMP. The project was a collaboration between the Air Force Research Laboratory, the Directed Energy Directorate, and Kirtland Air Force Base. CHAMP was able to shut down seven different targets before self-destructing, ensuring the technology wouldn't fall into enemy hands in a theater of combat. Lasers transfer heat onto their target, but a microwave gets up inside of the target and creates heat in the target. The concept of active denial systems has become really popular in the last 20 years. Governments, police, and even military want a way to control crowds and the movements of protesters without having to use lethal force. When I saw this Havana Syndrome news piece, the first thing that came to mind is that I remembered like 12 years ago, they did a bunch of advertisements trying to sell an active denial system that uses giant microwave emitters. A wave of extreme heat that comes from nowhere. It's one of the US military's newest non-lethal weapons, an electromagnetic beam that emits an odorless, invisible, and silent blast of heat. It felt like opening up an oven door, almost mixed with a sting from about my sternum to my neck. So like you started really feeling it on my neck before I had to kind of instinctively jump out of the way. Picture like an invisible searchlight, an invisible searchlight of radio waves going down range. So it's this big when it starts and at the end, it's the same size. Eventually, the weapon could be put to a wide array of uses, such as thwarting hostile attacks, dispersing mobs and reinforcing security. For now, it remains just a prototype. That's 12 years ago. That's a while back. But according to that piece, they had already been building and testing those microwave emitters for at least 14 years already. This weapon, under development for 15 years, has yet to be used in the field. So the rumor, or the scuttlebutt, was that they had been testing these in Afghanistan and Iraq. And the story was that they were overexposing people to these microwaves because they were either getting some kind of permanent damage to their bodies, or they were experiencing severe burns. And that was all an accident. The Americans were never supposed to do that. The Pentagon has not yet decided whether it will order the active denial system, whose powerful beam can reach up to a thousand meters. The technology has attracted safety concerns, though the US military says the rays do not penetrate the skin and pose no health risks. If an operator is, is squeezing the trigger and there's a lot going on and he uh, 
inadvertently keep squeezing the trigger, there's an automatic shutoff for three seconds. Out of 11,000 exposures on people, only two minor injuries have been reported. Now, I can't verify those kinds of stories, but the point is that the potential for harm does exist in devices like this. There's a reason why America and other world powers have been wishy-washy about the way that they communicate these devices to us. Because if they're using them on us, then potentially they're breaking international law by doing that. But they're also not telling us that they have them. For example, with the people that they're showing us in these tests that they're doing, they're all volunteers. They understand exactly what's happening. This is a military area. Move away from the perimeter. I say again, this is a military area. Move away from the perimeter. They know that their job is to stand in that field and that about a thousand yards ahead of them is a microwave emitter that's pointed directly at them. They know that their job is to wait until they feel that microwave and then they're supposed to run away. They even let any of the guests volunteer to test out its effectiveness and safety, <laughs> including the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, and Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Most described it as feeling like a hot oven or grill being opened up. For example, what if you're at a protest or outside of a government facility or building and you get hit by one of these? Are you going to immediately understand you're being hit by a microwave and know to run away? I'm not convinced. I think the average person, especially if they don't have regular internet access, is not going to understand what's happening to them. They'll probably just stand there confused, getting irradiated over and over again until they potentially burn. And it's important to understand what a microwave is doing. It's penetrating your body with radiation and trying to boil the water inside of your cells. Oh, oh yeah, that's non-lethal. It's just titillating the water molecules in your skin to evaporate out of your body no big deal this is why there's so much debate about whether or not microwaves should be legally allowed to be pointed at humans this is why international law has a problem with it the machine that we're using to generate the microwaves for these demonstrations is dangerous low-powered microwaves are not dangerous we're surrounded we're bathed in high frequency radiation all the time from cell phones to baby monitors to wireless systems but those frequencies will not ionize your DNA they will not cook you however high powered microwaves are dangerous I mean that's why they make them into weapons duh this is why international law prohibits the use of microwaves on a human being they also have legal hurdles to contend with you know, under current interpretations of international law, laser weapons are generally not considered you know, usable against people, so directly against people. So you can use them against a platform, you can use them against weapons, but using them uh, as an anti-personnel weapon is considered to be illegal. So you're seeing, you know, high power microwaves making its way into air defense missions, but there's this concern about fratricide and the beam width, and that's something that you know, they'll have to engineer out. And I want to believe that this is probably the main reason that the Pentagon has been hesitant to adopt microwave weapons as part of their arsenal. But even though not a single world government has had the balls to admit that they've implemented a microwave weapon as part of their active denial system, there have been people in several protests that have reported experiencing injuries that are consistent with microwave weapons. Recently, there's been a lot of interest in this because of all of the protests that are occurring around the world and the kinds of injuries that were reported. I've seen the videos and I've read the reports. There's facial swelling, there's swelling of the lips, the eyelids, there's burns, blisters. The injuries are, however, consistent with a microwave attack. There are microwave, weaponized microwave systems designed for what's called LRAD, but stands for long range area denial. So they do exist and it is plausible they may have been used in some of these protests. From what we're able to design today, directed energy weapons have a limited range to how far they're effective. Basically any vehicle or craft that has a directed energy weapon on board that's designed to stop missiles or rockets, you have to get pretty close in order to disable the target. I don't know what they teach you about physics in school or whatever, but light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and like any other electrical effect, it diminishes over distance. Oh, and directed energy weapons are basically useless in bad weather. If it's really foggy or there's heavy rain, all that water absorbs the energy before it hits the target. Now, the way microwaves work 
is they interact with water molecules. All electromagnetic radiation consists of photons and an associated electric field, a sinusoidal varying electric field. Because water molecules are dipoles, they're asymmetric. When a microwave interacts with a water molecule, it causes the water molecule to attempt to flip, to align itself with that varying magnetic field. That flipping of the water molecule creates frictional heating, transfers that heat to the non-responsive solids in the food, and cooks your dinner. A microwave oven are, operates at a low frequency, while a weaponized microwave system operates at a far higher frequency, between 80 and 120 gigahertz. So instead of a 12 and a half centimeter wavelength, the wavelength is down around 3, 3.2 millimeters. Because it's flipping those water molecules 100 billion times per second, there's much more energy deposited in each water molecule. As a consequence, you don't need very many water molecules to absorb all the energy and so all the energy is deposited in the outer layers, the outer one millimeter or so of the target tissue. <clears throat> but as potential targets for microwave weapons, this is something that we can use to our advantage. This light is caused by the microwaves interacting with the mercury inside the tube, and it elevates the outer electrons in the mercury, causing them to reach higher energy levels, and when they settle back down to the ground state, they release photons, UV photons that stimulate the phosphor inside of the tube to cause it to glow white. Remember, the basic effect of a microwave weapon is that it's trying to warm up the outer layer of our flesh by boiling the water inside of our cells. So all we need to do is put water in front of our cells so that those microwaves diminish before they touch our body. Now remember, when I hold this in front, it fluoresces. And as I move this away from the source, you can see that it works out to about, oh, heck, almost two meters here. But if I place the water barrier in front, like this, no fluorescence. This doesn't absorb all of the energy, but the water does absorb even the low frequencies significantly. And if we had the higher frequencies, this would be a complete protection. What's nice about that, if you just had a couple of water bottles and a towel, you could hold it in front of your face and you'd probably protect yourself from a weaponized microwave system. So basically all you have to do is wear a lot of wet, thick clothing or hold up a wet towel between you and the microwave emitter. Just get a beach towel, flood it with water, hold it up in front and you could dance away and you're perfectly safe. Easy, compact, and certainly not a threatening defense system. Or even better, if you've got some money, you can buy a big square of sheet metal to hold up between yourself and the microwave emitter. This is some thin sheet metal. The microwaves will reflect off of the metal. Watch what happens when I drop the metal in the way. Turns it right off. And so you can see that in order for this to glow, it pretty much has to be almost at the edge of the antenna. But once you get not even to the edge of the table, it dies off. I'm now gonna put a metal reflecting plate in front. And we can see when I put this in front, how much farther laterally the radiation goes. This is working as a deflector. Or even aluminum foil would work. We all have aluminum foil. A poster with some sort of a theme or something interesting on it. And laminate between the two surfaces some aluminum foil. So you've got metal in between the two layers of plastic. And when I place this in front, it kills it. But in my personal opinion, the best option is to buy a bunch of aluminum bug screen or windscreen material and cover yourself in a Faraday cage. Microwaves or any kind of electromagnetic radiation cannot pass through a space smaller than its wavelength. In this case, about 12 and a half centimeters. I've applied this screen to our riot shield. And this has a couple of advantages. First of all, you can see through it you retain the protection of the riot screen, but also protect yourself from the microwave. If I take this screen and I put it in front of the beam like this, I'm standing in the microwave beam and it's protecting me here, but not here. And I feel fine. A Faraday cage is pretty ideal because it'll allow you to see right through it. And even though it does deflect some of that microwave radiation, it absorbs some of it as well, so you're not gonna be hurting as many people around you with the deflection. 
remember it's like you're getting shot at by these so any kind of action you do to stop it from hitting you creates potential that it'll hit someone else instead so just keep that in mind when you're out in the field folks the metal will actually support a voltage the energy that's being deflected off of this to the sides see if we can get this to go is spread out. I mean, in theory, you could buy a bunch of that aluminum screen material and wear it as a suit of armor. I mean, that'd be hilarious if somebody showed up to a protest covered in aluminum bug screen. <laughs> Who's gonna stop them? Just make sure that when you do use the screen, it's aluminum screen, not the fiberglass that most modern window screens are made out of. It needs to be in aluminum. Like, if you're extremely f***ing paranoid and you think that there's a space in your house that is being constantly bombarded by microwaves, well, you could line that whole room in aluminum foil or in that bug screen material and create a Faraday cage for the entire room. Just remember though, that a Faraday cage is also going to stop radar from getting through. A Faraday cage is going to stop Wi-Fi or radio signals from getting through. So you're gonna have to hardwire your television and your phone and your internet in there. And I'm not trying to sell paranoia here. I'm just asking in the vein of this new issue, Havana syndrome. What is it that's causing this? And how many of us actually need to worry that this could happen to us? Yes, microwave technology exists and there are microwave emitters that were designed as crowd control. But this doesn't explain how it is that this attack is happening, who it is that's doing it, or what kind of microwave device they're using to do it. Active denial devices don't explain how people are experiencing long-term neurological effects from microwaves. There is not a single publicly known device that has the capability to send microwaves so deep inside of your brain that it can cause long-term brain damage. We cannot definitively sit here today and say, this is the machine or this is the thing they used to cause these injuries. We are not aware of a technology that does this. We've never seen a technology anywhere in the world that does this to people. Nothing we know of can cause this kind of damage. I've talked about microwaves before in my video about Foo Fighters. Microwaves have some extremely strange qualities. Nobody could have imagined that a microwave emitter that was designed to see things would be able to create a thing that you could see. The point I'm making here is that microwaves are versatile. They can do a lot of different things. You can use them for a lot of different purposes. And there are a wide range of radio frequencies that different electronic devices and electronic weapons are able to emit. This next slide gives you a description of definition of what a high power radio frequency microwave directed energy weapon is. In the community, it's also known as a number of other names that can be confusing if people don't realize they're all talking similar things. Some of those names are such things as electromagnetic weapons, RF weapons, non-nuclear EMP, electronic bombs, etc. Like think of the logic. Radar is just microwaves. Microwaves allow us to see things. Most of the electronics you have in your home emit some low level of microwave. It's just so weak that you can't feel it. You're not really usually able to perceive that. But in the modern world, we're constantly being bathed by different frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. A few years back, an engineering team was able to use the radio frequency coming off of a Wi-Fi router to build a really accurate model of what was happening in an adjacent room. Can we go from Wi-Fi radio signals, you know, sort of like the Wi-Fi routers in your house house, they're bouncing off radio signals that work sort of like sonar. Can you go from that to where human beings are to images? So what they did is they had a camera looking at a space with people in it. Um, that's sort of like coming in from one eye. The other eye is the radio signals, so sonar from the uh, Wi-Fi router. And they just learned to predict like 
this is where the human beings are. Then they took away the camera. So all the AI had was the language of radio signals bouncing around a room. And this is what they're able to reconstruct. Real time 3D pose estimation. Right? So suddenly AI has turned every Wi-Fi router into a camera that can work in the dark, specially tuned for tracking living beings. We're there, folks. The 1984 future is now. In theory, any of the electronics in your house could be setting off a signal that could be read by another device telling something somewhere what you're doing through your walls. Even your light bulbs could be watching you. All it takes is a smart enough AI and a powerful enough supercomputer to process all of that information and create usable data that people could watch in theory in real time. Maybe your Wi-Fi is watching you watch television. But here's the problem with those alleged microwave attacks that caused the Havana syndrome back in 2016. When I play detective here and I try to imagine what kind of device is capable of doing this and who would even want to do this outside of the obvious suspects of world powers. Well, I end up with a really bizarre list of possible culprits and causes for this. According to U.S. intelligence documents obtained by CNN, Russia has been developing this microwave attack capability for decades. See, with the information allowed to us by the best intelligence agencies in the United States, we're left with a bit of a dilemma. They fully admit that these microwave weapons exist and that they've been used on multiple American agents over the years. But they've not only said that they can't find a particular nation that can't be a suspect here, they've gone even further as to say that they believe that the assailant is not a foreign nation. So who the hell is it? The United States knows exactly what's happening here, and they believe that the culprit is not a foreign nation. Possibility number one, and I think the most likely possibility, is that this is not a weapon at all. Though it uses microwaves, it's not intended to cause harm. At least that's not its primary function. I think it's possible that this is actually some sort of an imaging device, maybe like a really old school rudimentary version of what modern scientists have been able to create. Real time 3D pose estimation. Except instead of using radio waves coming off of your Wi-Fi router, they were just using a giant radar antenna, basically just straight up filling buildings and rooms with microwaves and using it to image something about what's going on inside of those rooms. Maybe the reason that those agents in Russia got hit with microwaves was because Russia just wanted to see what they were doing in their hotel rooms. But they turned the device up a little bit too high and accidentally irradiated them. The Russians are the only country I know of who have previously targeted American diplomats with microwaves, although for a different purpose. That puts them at the top of a very short suspects list. The American embassy in Moscow. For years, the Russians bombarded it with microwave radiation. Many employees there developed blood problems. American officials protested, but also insisted there was no connection between the radiation and the problem. Maybe they used their imaging device to look inside of the brains or the bodies of those agents and accidentally caused permanent brain damage and nerve damage. Maybe the brain damage and the nerve damage were an unintended side effect. That's, I think, the most likely. See, the thing is, if you look at any chart that shows the difference between microwaves and radar, here's one that a military communicator has used to describe directed energy weapons in general. The main definition is, is that HPM dues are electromagnetic sources that can generate and direct intense radio frequency microwave <laughs> energy at a target. You'll see that the radar has a really fat overlap with just straight up dangerous microwaves. Like I said, radar imaging is created using microwaves. You'll see radar dips way deep into the dangerous microwaves territory. Foo Fighters, 
were an unintended side effect of radar. Pumping that much microwave radiation into the atmosphere, regardless of your intention, is eventually going to have electromagnetic side effects. And it's possible that if this technology exists, that only intelligence agencies would want to have access to it. And they definitely wouldn't want us to know that it's possible to do this. Graduate students have developed software that uses Wi-Fi signals to recognize silhouettes behind walls. To see movement in real time, a more primitive method is used. A simple red ball tracks this student as he makes his way through the room and takes a seat. Elevation data of a tracked object can show when a person has taken a fall. This is a device that basically um, tracks people through um, wireless signals. Uh, it can do so in a variety of ways from motion to identifying who a person is based on the shape of their skeleton as well as um, measuring their breathing and heart rate. Can you hold your breath? She took it, he inhaled a lot, so it went up, yeah, it's and then fast. it's constant, you see? So, which means because she's not holding her breath, and her heart rate is pretty high. They also say the technology has uses for law enforcement as well as the military. In case of hostage, for example, you don't want to send the police inside without knowing where the people are standing, where the hostages are, if there's somebody with a gun, where they are standing, so that they come prepared. So if it's possible for a computer to track a human being in a building, to know if they're standing or sitting, to know if they're breathing or if their heart rate is regular, if they could do that stuff back in like 2020, then that means it's possible that they were using a more rudimentary system back in the 60s or 70s that was just really high-tech radar. It's possible that there's a giant tower here on Earth that can see everything by bouncing its rays off of the ionosphere. Maybe they have a satellite in orbit above our heads that can see everything like the Eye of Sauron. And when they use that device, they point it at someone to watch them, they create a potential that there could be side effects. There's a potential that those microwaves could be harmful to the target, depending on how deeply they're trying to penetrate into their body, depending on what frequency they're using, depending on how many satellites they're using to do it. I started with the vertigo and the tinnitus and that brain fog. I could actually feel my brain shutting down, like it just, everything kind of went black. I'm standing and it's feeling as if I'm being pushed, like you're being smashed from the top of the head into the ground. I've heard descriptions like this before. What if the reason that that victim of a microwave attack felt like she was being crushed downwards towards the ground was because the microwave emitter was above her head. See, if the Americans had something like this, it makes a lot of sense why they would keep it a secret, especially if the Russians also had something similar. They wouldn't wanna just tell everybody that they know how this is possible. They wouldn't wanna just admit to the world that they understand how their own diplomats got harmed because then they would have to admit that they have their own device that does the exact same thing. I think at the very beginning, it was very hush-hush. Something is going on that the department doesn't know what it is, and we just need to be careful. Several of us went to the security office. We listened to the sound that they had recording, and I'm like, wow, that's the sound I heard. <laughs> they, they were pretty much, no, you, you know, you're, you're wrong. You're not, you, you didn't hear that. So that was the start of trying to figure out how to get people to believe me. I don't think anybody wants to be a victim, but there's nothing in the world that's worse than being a victim that everybody doubts. Remember, international law dictates that it's illegal to use a directed energy weapon on a human being. And if you've got an imaging device that has the side effect of damaging people, then it's technically a microwave weapon. It's technically a directed energy weapon. So admitting that you have it is admitting that you've been blatantly and openly breaking international law and using a directed energy weapon on human targets. Over the years, different world powers have created some extremely large and powerful imaging devices. 
I think maybe the physically the largest one ever was built in Russia. As a conventional radar can only see as far as the horizon, the woodpecker got around this problem by bouncing its signal off the ionosphere, enabling it to see over the horizon. To do this, an enormously powerful transmitter is needed. The Duga system was able to transmit at 10 megawatts. Monitoring station engineers in the UK thought that the actual powers involved were in the tens of megawatts, and a chief engineer of the BBC External Broadcasting estimated power levels at 20 or 40 megawatts, or perhaps more, and said that the signal was likely audible in every part of the globe. In theory, if you could focus all of the electromagnetic radiation coming off of that array, onto a single living room, chances are it would hurt anybody that's inside of that living room. But because the array is so large and the effect is spread out, probably to watch either Western Europe or even the waters over England, well, it's not gonna hurt anybody because all that energy is diffused. And like I said, radar and a lot of different imaging technology technically veers into the microwave range. So when you ask, when does an imaging device become so dangerous that it's technically a weapon? There's no definitive answer for that. No precedent has been created in international law because they're not even supposed to be using this stuff on humans at all. But it's possible that this microwave attack was perpetrated by a weapon and that the effects that that weapon had on the diplomats in Havana and all of the other agents and even civilians that have experienced this over the years around the world, maybe they were harmed on purpose with malicious intent. Maybe somebody is running around there with a secret microwave weapon that the world governments just don't know about yet. So if the perpetrator of these attacks was not a foreign government, that leaves a very small list of possibilities. It makes it more likely that the perpetrator is the United States government itself, or maybe the military or one of its intelligence agencies. Someone associated with the United States did this on purpose to their own civilians, to their own diplomats and their own agents as a way to manipulate perception about international relationships. Maybe the United States government's efforts to create relations with Cuba was just all theater. Maybe the whole point of all of that was just to make Obama look good. I mean, think about it. He got to show up like a celebrity. He got celebrated and cheered on by thousands of people. I got to before the embassy became the embassy. Shortly after I got there, we did the big signing and the whole hoopla. On a day when symbols mattered, the stars and stripes raised over the U.S. Embassy in Havana. We were so thrilled to be sent to Cuba at such a time. Just a few hours ago, this communist nation welcomed President Obama, who became the first American president to visit here in 88 years. We felt like we were part of history in the making. It was impossible not to feel that way. He got to be on the news and create hope and be a hero that looked like he was opening up the world and bringing peace to everybody. But in reality, they never actually intended to follow through with any of it, and they knew that it would be too much hassle and not really worth it. And what if the United States government or one of its agencies intentionally pointed those microwave weapons at their own diplomats just so that they would have an excuse to pull out of there and look like they're not being the bad guys by doing that? No, 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 they're the victims. What if the reason that the United States government has lied to the world and lied to its own diplomats about the existence of microwave weapons was because they always intended from the beginning to use those secret microwave weapons as a scapegoat to pull out of a plan they never intended on fulfilling. That's just one possibility. And that would also explain why the United States government has been so feeble in their attempts to actually help the people that are supposedly victims of Havana syndrome. I do not believe the department took me seriously. It was always, we'll get back to you. If we ask for more information, um, we'll get back to you. I have to ask myself, are they trying to disprove us or are they trying to prove what happened? Unfortunately, according to bipartisan critics, the State Department did not respond as aggressively as the CIA has and is now just catching up. Because I continue to be disappointed by the State Department's response, even though I've heard that you are committed to ensuring that people who have been affected get the medical care they need. But what I'm still hearing from victims is that 
that is not happening always. And so there's clearly a disconnect between what's happening at the top levels of the State Department and how people are being treated. Like, it seems like they don't want people to even really know outside of those that have been affected that you can have your brain melted by a microwave. Maybe they want that to be a secret because it's them doing it. However, if it's not the United States government doing it to its own people, and we take the American intelligence agencies at their word and assume that it's not a foreign government that's perpetrating these attacks, then who else could it be? What are our other possibilities? Whom could be bold enough to troll American diplomats with a microwave weapon, let alone do that knowing that they'll have their identity protected. Whom could be invested enough in foreign affairs to want to hinder good relations being built between two countries that operate in two separate economies? Whom could be powerful enough to build a giant microwave emitter that defies detection, yet is strong enough to be able to attack and target multiple people in multiple residences at the exact same time. God, I wonder who that could be.